So I'm going to have to ask you guys to sort of step back a bit from everything you know about contextuality. And for the next 30 minutes, just allow me to build it up for you from scratch. Uh, because I'm going to talk about like a slightly different uh, notion, but which reduces to the standard notion under some uh, specific conditions. So therefore, I seek your indulgence for the next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so in other words, um, you know, the previous two talks uh, have no bearing on this particular talk. I mean, they do in, in, in a sense, but uh, you should, uh, you know, let me build things from scratch. Okay. So what's the motivation for this uh, work? The motivation is to uh, to go beyond what are called uh, state-dependent proofs of uh, uh, quotient specter contextuality uh, for quantum theory to uh, to proofs of contextuality for arbitrary operational theories. And um, we've already shown how to do this for uh, state-independent uh, quantum contextuality that that arises from uh, quotient specter type sets. Uh, where where you appeal to quotient specter uncolorability, uh, so this is sort of in that line of uh, work, and uh, it's also a part of this larger project of making non-contextuality an experimentally testable hypothesis, in the sense that um, you do not want to assume determinism, just like you don't have to assume that in uh, local causality. In the case of local ca causality, the reason you don't need to assume determinism is because a factorizability is sort of a given to you, and by a fine's theorem you know, it's as good as uh, not having determinism. But in non-contextuality in general, I mean, factorizability is not sort of, you don't always have remote parties and remote settings, so you can't always assume factorizability. So that's that's sort of uh, what this line here means. When I say we don't want to presume determinism, it also means we don't want to presume factorizability. Uh, okay, so previously, uh, there's not been much work in this area. We just have two papers. Um, so in, in both of these papers, what we've done is, if, if you're aware of them, what we've done is that we've tried to obtain non-contextuality inequalities as constraints on uh, the predictability of some measurements with respect to certain sets of preparations. And uh, uh, this is what we did with the uncolorability proof in the, in the first paper here. And uh, I mean, uh, there's a more detailed follow-up which is in the works. Uh, in the second paper, uh, we went beyond the quotient specker notion of a context. Uh, I'll specify how we did that. I mean, the quotient specter notion is essentially this notion of uh, uh, footnote four, uh, commutative context, where you have, uh, you know, com commutation is your notion of a context. And um, I mean, I'm sure that's well known, but since I told you not to, uh, I've, there's a footnote there. Anyway, so uh, a quick intro to the basic notions that we need to uh, build up the uh, the definition. Uh, operational theory, an operational theory is a, uh, it's just a triple of uh, a list of preparation procedures that you can do in the laboratory, a list of, so that's um, the P, the, the script P, um, uh, the, and, and M is the set of measurements, you can, measurement procedures you can carry out in the laboratory, small p is the uh, distributions you can get over uh, outcomes of measurements, given preparations. So I mean, like this is what you typically do in a laboratory. You would do measurements on some preparations, and um, measurements are assumed to be normalized. Uh, and uh, the, uh, point, uh, the notation is here that this k given m uh, denotes the uh, measurement event, where outcome k occurs for the measurement m. So, uh, so this is an operational theory. Uh, an ontological model of an operational theory is an attempt to give an account of, of, of the operational theory as arising from a fact of the matter about the system you're trying to study. And so, so, so you want to ask for an underlying description for the operational theory. And here you uh, postulate this triple of uh, things. Uh, lambda is the space of uh, underlying states from which your preparations sample, uh, uh, yeah, from which uh, your preparation sample uh, and uh, and your uh, and the distributions according to which they sample are labeled by mu. Um, distributions are normalized. Uh, each measurement outcome is associated with a response function over the space of states. Uh, response functions are normalized, and uh, and there is this notion of uh, determinism. So this is what we want to get rid of. Uh, that if, if you assume that all these response functions are uh, completely deterministic, they only give you zero one values, 
which is that you're assuming that your ontological model uh, in some sense gives you a complete description of everything. It tells you what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. Then uh, that's, that's, that's the assumption of outcome determinism. And an ontological model of an operation theory should be empirically adequate uh, in the sense that it should reproduce the predictions of the theory when you force grain over the, um, uh, over the lambdas for a given preparation. Um, you recover the operational statistics. So this is how the two things should fit together. Uh, so these are just some basic constraints. Um, okay, so uh, now that we have an operational theory and we have a notion of an ontological model for, for that operational theory, um, we can talk about, well, just given an operational theory, we can talk about the notion of an operational equivalence between uh, the experimental procedures that the theory specifies. So uh, remember, we're only talking about pre prepare and measure experiments. So there are preparation instructions, there are measurement instructions. So um, I, call two, uh, I call two effects operationally equivalent. Uh, if no preparation procedure yields different outcome probabilities for them. So, which means there's no operational way to distinguish between these two effects. Um, and therefore, they're operationally equivalent uh, um, measurement events. Let me call them measurement events because effects is, would, you would think of that as an operationally equivalent class of events. Um, so, two measurement procedures, we call them operationally equivalent when, uh, you know, when their effects are in one-to-one -one correspondence with respect to uh, operational equivalence. And Two preparation procedures are operationally equivalent if, uh, if there exists no measurement event which can give different outcome probabilities for them. So there's no test you can do on those two preparation procedures uh, that can tell you which procedure was implemented. So operationally equivalent preparation procedures are called a preparation. Operationally equivalent measurement procedures are called a measurement. Um, and so what's the context? Actually, this, this is the point of departure from, from the, uh, the, the traditional question specter approach, which is so what do, what, do we, what do we mean by a context? Our definition of a context is any distinction between two operationally equivalent experimental procedures. So any distinction at all counts as a context. So this, uh, so what do we mean by an opera, uh, a distinction uh, be between two operationally equivalent experimental procedures? We mean, we, we mean a distinction which does not make a difference to the operational statistics. You know, it's, it's, it's a distinction, distinction that doesn't make a difference operationally. And what is contextuality? A contextuality Contextuality is the idea that this distinction sometimes necessarily makes a difference in any ontological model that tries to reproduce the operational statistics. So if you're trying to build an ontological model for the operational theory, then uh, contextuality says that uh, you, know, you necessarily have to introduce distinctions which don't show up operationally. So there's a certain redundancy in your ontological model. Uh, so examples of measurement context. So uh, the first example is what you would normally talk about in quotient specter, which is whether a certain measurement is jointly measured with, uh, M1 is jointly measured with M2 or with M3. So um, I call M1, uh, 2 the, so, so that's the coarse graining of, of um, M1, 2, like the st reduced statistics for M1 uh, when you coarse grain over 2. Uh, it's operationally equivalent to um, the uh, coarse coarse grain statistics of M1 uh, from M13, and that's operationally equivalent to just doing M1. So, so this is what you would normally talk about in, in, in a quotient specter uh, uh, discussion. And a second kind of measurement context, for example, could be uh, a different op operationally equivalent ways of implementing a fair coin flip POVM uh, measurement in, in quantum theory. So this, this paper here, for example, is a uh, footnote six is about um, uh, it uses that notion of a measurement context to derive an inequality. Uh, preparation context, now this has no analog in the, in the quotient specter approach. So here again we mean the same basic idea that, uh, uh, you know, you can do different procedures to make the, prepare the same density matrix. You can uh, mix, uh, spin Z up, Z down, or X up, X down to, with equal probability to prepare a maximally mixed state. Those are two different procedures, but they correspond to the same uh, preparation. So those are preparation contexts. Other kinds of contexts can be diff different purifications with respect to different ancillars for the same uh, state on a system A. Uh, okay, so, so this is what I mean by a, a context. Uh, what is non-contextuality? Uh, Rob Speckens likes to also call this Leibnizianity, uh, which is the idea of identity of indiscernibles. Uh, 
Um, so the idea is that if there exists no operational way to distinguish between two things, if there's no experiment, ex if your operational theory says there's no experiment that can distinguish between these two procedures, then uh, you should treat those two things as physically identical. So since your ontological model is supposed to be a deeper description of the physics, so you, you, want, uh, you want to preserve that equivalence in your uh, ontological model because there's no operational way to distinguish those things. So if you do not uh, contrapositively, this means that if two things are non-identical, if the, in the ontological model, model they have different descriptions, then there should exist an operational way to distinguish them. So it's, in some sense it's saying like, you know, there's no redundant uh, distinctions in the ontological model. Uh, it's that, that sort of, that's sort of the idea here. When we use the word non-contextuality, we mean the identity of indiscernibles. So measurement non-contextuality, uh, more specifically, is the idea that if two effects are, uh, if two measurement events are operationally equivalent, then the response functions we assign to them should be identical. If you couple this idea with the uh, with a further restriction that these response functions are also outcome deterministic, that instead of just being uh, probabilities, there are zero one valued probabilities, then you get the standard uh, quotient specker assumption. But we do not want to do that. Uh, preparation non contextuality is the idea that if two preparation procedures are operationally equivalent, then you preserve that equivalence in the ontological model. Um, yeah, so, so, so the, the distributions according to which they sample from the underlying uh, ontic state space are the same for, for two operational preparation procedures. And this is the hypothesis we want to test. We want to test whether it's possible to give a consistent account of, uh, of nature in terms of non-contextual ontological models. So uh, I said nature because uh, we want to talk of operational theories other than quantum theory as well. Um, okay. So at this point, are there any questions about uh, the framework? Because after this, I will go to the specifics. Uh, yes, is the notion of contextuality, it seems to be linked to a particular ontological model. Or are you... But, okay. So is that right? Or I mean, are you saying that there's, there's no way of uh, giving an ontological model? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is there's no way of giving an ontological model. So when I say contextuality, uh, this distinction sometimes necessarily makes a dif difference in any ontological model that you might try to come up with for an operational theory. So it's not a property of the pair operational theory and ontological model. It's a property of the operational theory because you're searching over all possible ontological models and you're asking, does it exist, does, is any of them non-contextual? And when you rule out the possibility that there exists a non-contextual ontological model for an operational theory, that's, that's, that's a property of the operational theory. It's not a property of the pair. Uh, that's, that's what I would say. Was that the question? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? That's Leibniz, by the way. <laughs> Wikipedia tells me it's Leibniz. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so more specifically, we are going to talk about a particular uh, compatibility scenario uh, where, uh, so I'm just going to define the operational equivalences the first the scenario, the operational equivalences we need, and then we'll see how we use the assumption of uh, non-contextuality. So the scenario involves like three measurements, uh, M1, M2, and M3. Those dotted um, uh, edges in the hypergraph sort of denote the relationship of joint measurability. So M1 is jointly measurable with M2, M2 with M3, M3 with M1. And uh, they're dotted because I've not specified how you're going to do these joint measurements. So we are going to consider two different implementations of the joint measurements. So the, the black thing there is uh, M12, M23, M31. These are specific implement procedures that you carry out to implement uh, those three measurements, uh, joint measurements that you carry out to implement those three. And uh, uh, the blue thing is a different set of joint measurements you do to recover the same set of marginals. The, rela the, the, the constraints on them are uh, essentially this, uh, that the marginal uh, you get by coarse graining over measurement uh, over the index 3 here is equ operationally equivalent to the measurement M1. And the marginal you get from uh, coarse graining over 2 here, it's operationally equivalent to, again, M1. So this is like a no signaling or no disturbance condition that you would talk about, right? Like, regardless of how M1 is measured, whether it's measured with, M, uh, with 2 or with 3, or just on its own, the operational statistic stays the same with respect to all uh, preparations. That's that's the idea here. This notation is uh, what I introduced in my definition of operational equivalence. 
So similarly for M3, you have th these operational equivalences. M2, you have these operational equivalences. And the way these two implementations are related is because they have to recover the same set of uh, single measurements. And what we want to do eventually is to look at uh, this average measurement. So we are course training over these three joint measurements. And we are saying we randomly pick one of the three joint measurements. And we call this, this, this course grain measurement an M star measurement. And we call this, uh, uh, this the, the prime measurements an M star prime measurement. So this is the, uh, the, the measurement settings. Like this, this is what we are going to do in the experiment. Uh, is everything clear? Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, so secondly, uh, we are also going to need some preparation procedures. So note that in, in, in standard accounts of contextuality, you never talk about preparation procedures or their operational equivalences because you're always assuming outcome determinism and you, in, in effect, you don't really sort of, uh, so, so, there, so it, there it makes sense to say some, uh, there are, there's a certain state independent notion of contextuality. But in this account, typically you always need preparations. So, so the distinction between state independent and state dependent is sort of vacuous in this particular picture because we're always talking about preparations. And uh, so that, that's why whenever I say state dependent or state de independent, the, it's in scare quotes. Uh, so preparation procedures. Uh, so with every measurement, uh, we associate two preparations. Uh, P I with measurement M I, we associate two preparations, P I and P I perpendicular. And they are supposed to, uh, if you if you mix them uh, equally, then uh, the mixture for P uh, for uh, so P1 and P1 perpendicular is supposed to be operationally equivalent to the mixture for P2 and P2 perpendicular, P3 and P3 perpendicular, and also uh, it's supposed to be equivalent to another a pair of uh, preparations. Their average is again P star average. So that yellow region is like region of operational equivalence for the for uh, preparations. P star is actually the preparation on which we will carry out uh, the joint measurements. Uh, and the others are the ones which characterize how uh, uh, noiseless or how noisy your measurement are. Yes. Basically, we need P1 and P1 perpendicular and preparations like those to quantify how predictable your measurements are. Uh, OK, so, so we have operational equivalences between measurements. We have operational equivalences between preparations. Now we are ready to apply the assumption of non-contextuality. So remember that the assumption of non-contextuality was that implication from uh, uh, the operational theory to the ontological model. And, and so we are going to apply that assumption uh, for this particular case. So what are the quantities of interest? The, the quantities of interest that we are going to look at in this experiment are the, the probability of anti-correlation for um, um, measurement M star implemented on some preparation P. So that's the definition of, of uh, 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 the quantity P anti. Uh, yeah, that's just, just the average probability of anti-correlation in measurement M star. Uh, M star prime, again, there's a corresponding uh, quantity which quantifies the anti-correlation, you see. And then there's this new quantity uh, called the predictability of the pair uh, M and P, where it's defined as uh, two times the max probability. So M is a two-outcome measurement. Uh, sorry, I probably forgot to mention that. So M1, M2, and M3 were binary measurements, so each one had two outcomes. So this is essentially the predictability of the measurement. Why? Because if it's a random um, measurement, like just a fair coin flip, then the predictability is zero. If it's uh, a predictable measurement, then on, on the preparation P, then uh, uh, the predictability is one. So intuitively, like, that's, that's the idea. Uh, that's, the, that's why I use the word predictability for it. Uh, and the quantity we are interested in is this eta average. We call this the average predictability of the three measurements with respect to the corresponding uh, PI, PI perpendicular preparations. Um, OK, so, so these are the three quantities that are going to enter our inequality. And uh, uh, so these are the inequalities. Uh, so, so the first inequality is uh, constraining the, so there are two experiments that are happening. You're doing um, the measurement M star or the preparation P star. And uh, you're also doing measurement M star prime on uh, preparation P star prime. And you have a PR piece of perpendicular, and you have uh, verified all the operational equivalences I asked of you in the beginning of the experiment. So you have, you have make sure, made sure that everything is operationally equivalent. There's there's no signaling in a way, and uh, so so that's the first experiment. Uh, for that, uh, if you assume that there exists a non-contextual model, 
then this inequality should be satisfied, the, the first inequality. The, the second inequality is, again, you're just doing the same set of measurements, M star, on, 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 on P star and P star perpendicular, and again, you see the same sort of bound, but here you're doing, like, you know, the same set of measurements on two different preparations. Um, there you were doing, like, both different implementations. And the third one is uh, just, just for a single measurement, you have uh, that particular bound, or uh, two-thirds times two minus eta average. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, for eta average uh, equal to one, these inequalities are essentially what you would call quotient specker inequalities because um, um, because because two uh, so, so when, whenever you put eta equals one, uh, for the first case the upper bound is four thirds, uh, second case four thirds, third case it's two thirds. And that's what you expect in a, in a deterministic non contextual model because there are eight possible assignments you can do to, eight deterministic assignments you can do to, to three binary measurements. And none of them have more than two anti-correlated pairs. So if you look at the, all, all the three bit strings, then none of them have more than two anti-correlated pairs of bits. And uh, they're characterized by like the, the corresponding inequalities are like four sort of quotient specter type inequalities, which are, uh, which are essentially a constraint on the, the anti-correlation. So, so this inequality is just a constraint on the anti-correlation you see for uh, the three measurements. So ij varies over the three pairs. And uh, yeah, so if you divide this by <coughs> three and you look at uh, m star, then this is two-thirds. And that's, that's so two-thirds, so it should be obvious from these eight deterministic vertices that a two-thirds is the bound that you should have for uh, a deterministic non contextual model. But here, we, we, here we, we're not really starting with that assumption and uh, I, have, I haven't shown how, you, how to derive these inequalities. I could do that if there was some time, but probably there wouldn't be. So uh, just uh, believe me that these inequalities follow from those assumptions of non, uh, the operational equivalences we had and the uh, uh, assumption of non-contextuality applied to them. So it, it so happens that only for the case where you've um, verified that the predictability of your measurements with respect to these preparations, these, uh, this quantity eta average, it's equal to one, only in those cases is it justifiable to use something like a quotient specker type inequality. In all the other cases, so for example, if you look at, a, at the completely noisy case, like where there's no predictability at, at all, then your eta average is zero because almost every, so every measurement is like a fair coin flip, completely noisy, no, doesn't tell you anything about the preparation. So in that case, your eta average is always zero. And what happens when eta average is zero? When eta average is zero, the bound on the anti-correlations is trivial because it says that it's bounded by two, and that's just the uh, the algebraic bound. And that's, I mean, there's nothing. Uh, so, so, so what what these inequalities do is they tell you, they quantify how uh, pure your measurements are in some sense, and and uh, you know this noise is taken into account in in the bounds themselves. Um, so, uh, so there's a whole range of uh, so you have to characterize your measurements before you sort of trust an inequality. That's, that's sort of the lesson from these inequalities. The first one is in blue because that's the one I know how to violate. I have a construction for that. The other two, I don't have a construction yet. It, uh, this is ongoing work with Rob Speckens. Like, it's not published anywhere yet. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to find constructions for the other two as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this is just the, I'm just describing the, the set of assignments you can do to the three so there are three pairwise distributions here. Each distribution has four elements, and they live in uh, in this polytope with eight deterministic vertices. And um, these are the four inequalities characterizing them. Um, so there are eight deterministic vertices, and there are four indeterministic vertices for this scenario. The indeterministic vertices are essentially the ones where you have like perfect anti-correlation for all three pairs, and the other one, other ones are the are those where uh, you have uh, yeah, you have uh, perfect anti-correlation for uh, one pair and perfect correlation for the others. Uh, so these are all extremal models, uh, the four, four extremal models. And uh, oh, I, and the thing to note here is that the reason we get these inequalities instead of something that you would get from a quotient specter type analysis is because we do allow preparations to sample from lambda that correspond to indeterministic vertices. Because since we are not assuming outcome determinism, and we have no reason to assume factorizability in, a, in an experiment that's just done in a single lab, like I can't appeal to relativity to say that no disturbance should be true or no signaling tube should be true, then um, then I have no reason to sample only from the deterministic vertices. I should sample also from the indeterministic vertices, 
And the, the way I get constraints is from the operational equivalences um, and the assumption of non-contextuality. Like if 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 you uh, if you decide to restrict yourself to sampling only from the deterministic vertices, you're back to the quotient specter uh, case. Uh, so yeah, this is just a rewriting of the inequalities in terms of predictabilities, just to sort of draw an analogy with like previous inequalities we have derived, uh, just to sort of for people who might have seen those papers. In all those papers, there's on the left-hand side there's some uh, inequality, there's some quantity that characterizes how good your measurements are in some sense with respect to certain preparations. And on the right-hand side is some number which bounds things. But here we don't have a number; we have the we have a variable thing which is the anti-correlation probability. So, so, so one thing to sort of realize here is that if, for example, you had perfect anti-correlation, when is that surprising? When is it surprising that? You have perfect anti-correlation for the M-star measurement and perfect anti-correlation for M-star prime measurement. So that's not surprising if your measurements were completely noisy. If, if, if eta average was equal to zero, then that's not surprising. Only when there's some degree of predictability in your measurements is it surprising that you got a perfect anti-correlation. So you should not just, at least in this approach, you should not jump ahead to the conclusion that you've seen something non-classical just because you've seen anti, uh, perfect anti-correlation. You should also go check if your measurements were uh, sufficiently good. If, if they were too noisy, then, I mean, it's not surprising that you saw some anti-correlation because you could just have like a machine flipping a fair coin and deciding whether to show up the outcome 0, 1 or outcome 1, 0. And like without caring about what preparation went into the machine. And, and that's, that's, I mean, I, it's difficult to imagine that that's something non-classical because you can always program for that, right? Uh, unless, of course, you're assuming some sort of a deterministic sort of... Uh, uh, machine or something. Uh, okay, so um, so is there a quantum realization for for that scenario? So now, uh, when you think about quantum realization, you have to realize that you have to realize that or quantum realize that it cannot be in terms of sharp or projective measurements because we have like three uh, measurements which are pairwise jointly measurable, and since we want to violate something like that two-thirds bound, we cannot have sharp measurements uh, m1 corresponding to a sharp measurement because then like all of them commute and like you know you cannot you can simultaneously assign values and you can never exceed two thirds. So so that's the first reason why you need uh, unsharp measurements for this case. Secondly, the measurements necessarily again have to be unsharp or non-projective if you're going to do, do two different joint implementations of them. Because with sharp measurements, we never talk about two different ways of implementing a sort of sharp measurement for because it's always the the product of the two PVMs that's the unique joint measurement for uh, a pair of sharp uh, projective projection value measures. So, so there is that freedom when, when you're thinking about POVMs, uh, there's, there's this non-uniqueness and that allows you to do two different implementations for the same uh, set of marginal measurements. Uh, secondly, uh, since the measurements are non-projective, non we are not guaranteed the existence of preparations with respect to which they are perfectly predictable. So for projective measurements, you're guaranteed that because you can always pick an eigenstate and then it's perfectly predictable. Right, um, uh, either one or zero, right. uh, and uh, uh, so 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 it's not clear that uh, eta average will be one with non-projective measurements, and so what we construct is a qubit realization, which is with unsharp measurements, and the predictability is imperfect. The measurements are not sharp, uh, which should be obvious why they're not sharp. Um, the quantum violation is for this particular inequality. Uh, the realization is for qubit POVMs of this noisy form, these are just noisy spin observables. Uh, eta naught is the noise parameter. When eta naught equals one, then you have projective measurements. Uh, and when eta naught is equal to zero, you have like just coin flips, yeah, nothing non trivial going on. And uh, in between, you have some noisy sort of uh, spin measurement. Uh, so th these are the POVM elements for each of the uh, MIs, M1, M2, and M3. Uh, and the preparations that we use, the PI and PI perpendicular, are the ones that correspond to uh, these rank one projectors along the directions. So if MI was a measurement along the NI direction, a noisy measurement along the NI direction, then I'm choosing the, <coughs> the corresponding preparations, PI and PI perpendicular, to be uh, the pair of orthogonal uh, uh, preparations corresponding to that direction, the, these two rank one projectors. So the, these are just like uh, this quantity with eta naught equals one. That's the projective. And, um, and P star is a qubit state given by some direction n star. And P star perpendicular is orthogonal to that. Um, 
Also note that pairwise uh, in quantum theory when you require pairwise joint measurability of these three sort of uh, noisy qubit POVMs, then uh, the noise parameter has to satisfy this constraint, uh, which is that uh, it's given in terms of the angles between the three uh, measurements that you're trying to implement uh, in an unsharp manner. So this is sort of the general constraint. If you put, if you put e, uh, like x, y, z, you know, that, that's the standard well-known example. If you put that here, then uh, you you just have like a, a zero for all of these. So one over root two is the uh, is a well-known bound. This is just the general expression for this. This is known in the literature. Uh, I did not uh, prove this. Um, I think it's uh, due to uh, Paul Bush and then later on uh, U and O. Uh, okay. Uh, joint measurements. Uh, so these look a little ugly. Ravi, Ravi. Uh, your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is it 20 minutes or? It's Mr. 30 minutes. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's on video now. Uh, so, uh, I'm sure it's that is. Anyway. Uh, okay, so the, 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 the measurement directions we use are the trine sort of measurements. Uh, this is These are like the joint POVMs. They're like in four different quadrants. And uh, anyway, so just, just believe me that it, it's, this thing is violated. And at some point when it's up on the ar archive, I can send you a copy. Um, <laughs> and like, there's also a generalization to arbitrary n. We have a generalization for like odd n cycles, even even n cycles, uh, <coughs> even even n cycles. Uh, okay, so takeaway. Uh, so non-sexuality inequalities we can derive from them for speckered scenario. Uh, Unsharp measurements are fundamental to testing uh, these ones. And this is, all this is a work in progress. I mean, we need to show uh, a lot more for like the standard sort of accounts of. Like for example, the Kliashko account. There is an analog of Kliashko here, but I'm not sure whether the the, the Q-trip case will. I mean, I think in an approximation it can be recovered, uh, like with some sort of noise parameters added to the inequality, like the predictability parameter. Okay, so any any questions? <laughs> well, um, let's thank him. Yes. <laughs>
I'm just wondering how justified would it be to use uh, to assume that you know you have this independence of settings, like you know of uh, of a measurement you're doing right you know next to you or something. So, so the the, the reason that the for the question specter case we we are proposing corrections is that in some sense, and not for the Bell case. Okay, perhaps we should discuss this okay. afterwards.